Um, the only issue that typically can come up with these guys is sometimes they can get an upper respiratory tract infection with our higher humidity. So I would always recommend if you're going to have a reptile that you be in contact with a, a veterinarian that can, con that can care for them. Uh, Dr. Lynn and I at the Animal Care Center on Old Shell Road is a certified reptile veterinarian, and that's who all of my reptiles go to. Um, Missouri goes once a year and gets a checkup and makes sure she doesn't have any parasites. And if you get one of these guys from a pet shop, especially I believe B&B Pet Shop and PetSmart carry them right now for about 150 bucks. Um, these are wild caught adults that they have. And so you would need to make sure that you don't have a parasite load in your brand new pet because if you do, they stop eating and then you come in and stop. Oh. Um, but again, they're great little pets. Um, I, I, I love them. I had looked at doing some of the, uh, the phylogeny on them, the, um, the, how they evolved through some of their fossils. And, uh, uh, that may still be something in the future that I am doing, but again, if anybody wants to come up and see her, she's down here, and I thank you all for your time. Before we get into the ball python, I'm going to talk a little bit about venomous snakes, and uh, I'm going to take out one of the things that come quick. Um, I do want to cover a little bit while we're on the subject of our native species. For those of you who do hiking or outdoors, uh, we have about 40 some odd species of snake in our area. Um, about six of those species are venomous. Uh, I always tell people who are not really into snakes and are worried about you know, encountering a venomous snake in the wild that instead of focusing on trying to memorize what all 40 of those species of snake look like, why don't you just focus on uh, what the what the, uh, the venomous species look like, and then, and then just go from there. Um, I had a sister who used to work at a bank, which she would always taught how to look for counterfeit money, was simply just to look at real money all the time. And so whenever she was in, in her counter counterfeit money, she would know what it was, so kind of applied the same aspect. Uh, probably one of the most common species that we have is the Western Copperhead. I apologize for not getting out of this. I'm generally going to find these around waterways. Um, they're a big, very heavy bodied snake. Um, this is the juvenile right here. Typically kind of banded a little bit. Uh, as you can see on the board, they're very wide. You know, typically everybody says the triangular shaped head is kind of what you go for. Um, they typically will put on a show. Um, they get kind of their name because they have that really distinguishable, very white mouth inside them. Um, they average between four and six feet long. And again, you know, you're not going to find them out in the woods. You're going to find them near waterways. So um, the tricky part is that there's also about seven species of harmless water snakes in our area. So, uh, but you know, the water moccasin or the cottonmouth is uh, the biggest species, and also probably the most aggressive. We want to try to familiarize uh, yourself with, with that animal. Um, the set, probably one of the most second common species is the, the southern copperhead. Again, it's in the pit viper family. It has that big, wide, triangular shaped head. Um, you're going to find these sometimes around water, but you might find them in some woodland areas as well. Uh, they're a little bit more variable in pattern. Sometimes they can be almost reddish and burgundy in color. Um, sometimes they can be tan. Sometimes they can be almost yellowish. Um, younger individuals have a very distinguishable yellowish tail. Babies actually use this to lure um, amphibians. It looks like a little worm, and they will actually use it and it attracts amphibians, and that's how we catch the prey. So that is one distinguishing feature to how you identify a juvenile copperhead. Um, probably the third most common venomous species is the uh, is the uh, the pygmy rattlesnake. Sometimes known as the ground rattler. 
very small, probably one of the reasons they're some argue is the most dangerous venomous snake in our area because they're so small. Um, unlike most rattlesnakes, you know, their rattle sounds like an insect buzz. You're not going to hear the, the, the very distinctive, you know, what you would think of a rattlesnake would sound like in the woods. Um, but they look a lot like a lot of harmless species in our area, like little baby corn snakes, baby gray rat snakes, uh, baby eastern hongo snakes, closely resemble a ground rattler. So they're very easily mistaken for other species. Um, so again, those are probably, out of our six venomous species, those three are the most common. Um, of course, we have the eastern diamondback rattlesnake, very well-known venomous uh, snake in our area. I think they're easily identifiable. Um, they're probably the second largest venomous snake in North America. They look just the same as when they're babies as they do when they're eight feet long. Um, again, big triangular head, big heavy body snake. Um, they make, typically make a lot of rat, rat, uh, racket whenever you get near them, although there has been recent studies that in some areas where they have rattlesnake roundups, which is a very controversial uh, practice, there's been some, some studies with timber rattlesnakes and some of the western diamondback rattlesnakes that rattlesnakes have learned not rattle when approached, which is a very interesting evolutionary adaptation because in the area where these rattles, these roundups are occurring, you know, a snake that makes a lot of racket is a snake that's going to be collected for a roundup, and that means that's a snake that's going to be collected and go to a festival where it's going to get its head chopped up and uh, scanned. Of course, a rattlesnake doesn't know that, but, you know, as far as prey-predator relationship, they've somehow adapted to that. So a very interesting study, I think it, it definitely warrants uh, some more research in that area than thought it's interesting to point that out. We also have the timber rattler. Not very common down here in the south, but uh, there's some isolated uh, isolated uh, populations here in the Bowling County. Um, very similar to Eastern Dimeback, they're very large, heavy body rattlesnake. Um, you're only going to find them in uh, Longleaf pine areas, very deep woodland areas. Uh, you're not going to find them, you know, right here in urban mobile in the backyard or anything like that. Let's look out in the country. Um, very unique rattlesnake. And then, of course, uh, we have the coral snake. Everybody's probably heard the angel saying, you know, red on yellow, kill a fellow, red on black, friend of Jack. And some people get mixed up and people get freaked out. Um, I would like to point out that up until about four years ago, the last coral snake ever documented in Alabama was about four years ago. These are very, very secretive snakes. Um, it, you would, you're more likely to get attacked by a dog, an elephant, a donkey, get struck by lightning, get attacked by a shark, get <coughs> hit by a surfboard, um, than ever even see a coral snake in a while unless they get bitten by one. Um, but as you can see here, uh, you know, I kind of outlined the, the poem a little bit. And so as you see on these bands, if the red touches those yellow bands, that is eastern coral snake. Um, with a few exceptions out west, that's a pretty good rule here in North America that you can go by as far as identifying it. On the other hand, we have a harmless species in our area called the scarlet king snake. The other part of the rhyme is if red touches black, friend of Jack. These guys only get about three or four feet long. Uh, they're perfectly harmless. They eat lizards, other types of reptiles. Um, how many? How many of y'all know how king snakes got their name? Because they oh, okay. don't eat other snakes. That's true. Um, and so I did bring one king snake here today. This is a eastern king snake. This is one of the largest species of king snakes that we have in North America. Um, we actually don't have them here in, in Mobile County, but they're actually on the other side of the bay in, down in Baldwin County. Uh, we have speckled king snakes here uh, on this side of the bay. Uh, but these guys uh, are some of the largest and strongest con uh, harmless constrictors that we have in our area. 
or in North America in general. And like Laura said, they get their name because while they do eat a lot of other different types of animals, they will eat other than the snakes, including other rattlesnakes. Um, I'm sure as soon as I'll get out of here, go on to you, you can go on YouTube, and go on Google, and you'll find plenty of pictures and videos of king snakes constricting, killing, and eating, you know, rattle, diamondback rattlesnakes and whatnot. Um, speckled king snakes and eastern king snakes typically get between four and six feet long, so um, speckled king snakes are very similar in appearance, except instead of these bands that you see on this guy, they're just black and they just have little yellow spots all over them. Um, they're pretty easily identifiable, and they're very cool snakes you can find them. They're very similar in behavior to corn snakes and the fact that they're usually pretty docile. If you ever find them, they do make pretty good pets. They'd be a little bit larger than corn snakes, but um, taking care of them is very similar. They, they, you know, use a, 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 in captivity. The the old adage is that usually king snakes will eat anything. So a healthy king snake is a is a one that's very easy to take care of. So that's all I got. Laura, if you want to come up and uh, talk a little bit about all my <coughs> Pythons, I'd like to add a little on to what Mike was talking about. Um, I like to go herping, just kind of short for herpetology. Uh, that's if you're into the study and uh, of snakes and amphibians and lizards, stuff like that. I love going to the woods and finding where I can find anoles, snakes, other snakes. And um, basically, if you're out in the woods and you enjoy being outside, just if you can't clear identify a snake, or any reptile species, just leave it alone. I mean, a, a stick in the woods is your friend. If you're going through some underbrush and you're not sure if a snake might be hiding there or something, go ahead and poke, you know, go poke the grass and sometimes something will run outside away from you because it's, you know, it got scared off. So, like I said, most snakes really are aggressive. They will flee from you. So just, you know, if you don't know what it is, leave it alone. Okay, so I read ball pythons, that's my hobby. I love it. Um, this is an example of a normal colored ball python. Uh, really pretty, you know, in their own right. And uh, these guys, great pets, like I said, they're the second most common pet snake in America, other than, you know, corn snakes. Um, they're average about three to five feet long very easy to take care of. You give them uh, a big mouse or a small rat once a week and clean their poop up once a week and they're pretty happy. Just keep them the right temperature, give them the right humidity in their cage. And uh, they're super tame. I wash dishes with them around my neck just because they're, I don't know. I, I love them. I, my very first snake was a corn snake and I really enjoyed them. But um, I want something a little bigger without being too big of a responsibility, and these are the perfect snake.